Okay, well good afternoon everyone, welcome. Um, my name is Kate Charlesworth. I am um, a recent, very recent, as of a couple of days ago, fellow of the faculty um, and I'm based in Sydney. My main interest is in climate change and environmentally sustainable healthcare and uh, I'm currently undertaking a PhD on this issue, which is what I've been asked to speak about today. Um, but before I do that, I'll just have to fill you in, I guess, a bit on my, my training and my background and what, what is happening in this field, uh, just by way of introduction. Um, Nina has mentioned the chat option. I am very happy for you to ask questions at any time, just using that chat option. Um, and then Nina will share those with me at an appropriate, you know, as I'm changing slides or whatever. Um, so we should be able to discuss things to some extent as we go along. Um, there will also be a, a sort of more formal opportunity to ask questions uh, at the end of the session. Okay. So as I mentioned, I'll first just make some introductory comments um, about climate change and so on. Um, then I want to talk about the Sustainable Development Unit, the SDU, uh, which is in the UK. Um, so as for a period of my training, um, for several years actually, I lived and worked in London and um, from 2009 to 2010 I worked at a place called um, the Sustainable Development Unit, SDU, um, originally the NHS, originally set up within the NHS in the UK. Um, so I just want to talk a little bit about the SDU and uh, the main achievements of that unit. So that really leads um, quite nicely then into uh, the next part which will be about my doctoral research. Uh, so I am one year into a three-year uh, doctorate uh, with the University of Canberra and that has a, my uh, research has a very long title as you would expect but essentially it's about what a future sustainable health and social care system might look like um, and then also how we best transition towards that. Um, moving along, uh, to pockets of the future in the present. So obviously uh, it's very difficult to, um, much impossible to distill 12 months of research into a 30 minute presentation. So I've just chosen two uh, aspects of my research to discuss. Uh, the first one of that is the pockets of the future in the present. Uh, that's the first paper that I wrote um, and that essentially is about uh, emerging trends in healthcare. Uh, and then the second um, thing that I've selected is um, an illustrative case study uh, and that is the story of South Central Foundation in the US. So I'd like to finish with that story. Uh, and then Not to interrupt you, um, would you be able to slide that little tour bar towards the to bottom? Alright, okay, is that in the way? That one? It's a bit, yeah, I mean, if you can put it wherever it doesn't kind of okay. appear over the slides. Yeah, okay, sure. Yeah, that's that better? Yep, excellent, thank you. Thank you. How do you get it back then, Nina? Pardon? How do you get it back afterwards to slide up? Oh my God. Yeah, cool. I think that you have that kind of toolbar that disappears, thank so you. once it disappears, you should be able to get it back. Yeah, that does help. Okay, I'll deal with that at the end. Okay. Um, thanks, and then as I mentioned, there'll be um, time to ask any formal questions at the end. Oh. Okay. Great, so climate change. Climate change is a game changer. Uh, if we are uh, going to limit our temperature rise to about 2 degrees Celsius, which is what scientists tell us may, may give us a chance of um, limiting potentially catastrophic uh, climate, climate change, then every sector of the economy, um, which that includes energy, urban design, transport, everything, including health, is going to have to transform very rapidly. And uh, I guess the overarching aim of today is to, let, is to let you know that there are things going on in that space much more overseas, less so in Australia, um, and that sort of my aim today is to draw your attention um, to, the, to, the, to that work that's going on. 
Uh, so as I mentioned earlier in 2009-2010 I worked at the SDU uh, in the UK. This is a, a small unit it's based in Cambridge um, and it was set up in uh, 2008. Then within, at that time it was set up within the NHS. So it used to be called the, NA, the NHS Sustainable Development Unit, now just the SDU. Um, as you can see it's subsequently after its initial sort of inception in the NHS, its, its role has now been expanded to include public health and social care. Um, but initially set up within the NHS with the task of helping the NHS to become a low carb, a leading low carbon sustainable organisation. And um, obviously with that sort of task, the first thing that you need to do is to work out, well, what your emissions are. At that stage they had no idea what the carbon footprint of the NHS was, no idea what their starting point was. So that, that's what they started out doing. Their main, the first main task was to measure the carbon footprint of the NHS in England. And this next slide, so it should now be on the slide um, with the pie graph. Before you look at too much of those graphs, just to let you know the, the carbon footprint of NHS in England, um, sorry, the NHS and health and social care systems in England in 2012 was 32 million tonnes of CO2 equivalent. Now that's a pretty abstract figure, none of you will have much idea about how much that is, but it's enormous. It's more than the total emissions from an entire medium sized country. So these are big numbers that we're talking about. Um, then if you're looking at the graph, look at the, the pie chart part first. So that 32 million tonnes is divided up here into three main parts. The first one, that yellow section, um, is travel and that's at 13% um, and that includes patients, staff and visitor travel. Um, then the next one, the, the green section uh, segment, is building energy use. So that's um, heating, lighting, air conditioning, those sorts of things for all the NHS facilities. And then the biggest um, part by far is procurement. That's the big blue section, that's at 72%. So then if you look to the left, to the, to the bar chart on the left, that's actually a breakdown of the 72%. And you can see in that bar chart that the biggest single sort of unit contributor to the carbon footprint is pharmaceuticals um, at 5.6 million tonnes of CO2 equivalent. Um, and then if you sort of ignore the commission services, which is the green one, then the next two are medical instruments and equipment and then business services. So just to make the point, before they did this exercise, nobody had any idea that pharmaceuticals, for instance, were so carbon intensive. Um, and uh, nor that sort of building energy use perhaps wasn't as uh, important um, as had been previously thought. And so these, uh, these areas now what the SDU refers to as the carbon hotspots, obviously the areas that require particular attention. Um, and just to preempt a question, I usually get a question about why is pharmaceuticals so significant? Um, just to explain that a bit further, if you think about the supply chain, if you think about pharmaceuticals, they're very chemical and so carbon intensive um, products. There's a very long supply chain. Um, think about the process, research and development process, then sort of design, manufacture, distribution, transport, um, and then waste is a significant amount, significant amount as well. Um, and often these uh, goods are manufactured um, in quite sort of distant parts of the world and then shipped halfway across the world um, to the, you know, to the health system that's, that's for them. So that's why um, pharmaceuticals is, is such a significant part. Um, any other questions about that please? As we said, use the, the chat option or ask me at the end. So this exercise really gave, gave a huge amount of information about what the, where the NHS was currently tracking. So that's about where they're at. This next slide is about where they're going. We just call this the ski slope graph. Um, I'll just I'll talk you through it. So the x-axis down, down the bottom, across the bottom, um, is the year um, running from 1990 right up to 2050. That's what 35 years hence now. 
um, on the y-axis, you've got the, the carbon emissions. And the units for those are millions of tonnes of CO2 equivalent. And then the, on the actual graph itself, the dark blue line is the emissions um, to date. So that shows 2012 or 2013, that dark blue line. Then the light blue line is the, the trajectory, the forecast tr tr um, emissions um, up to about 2025. And then the red and then the orange lines are the target for the, for the, SD, for the NHS. Now these targets were set in accordance with the Climate Change Act. So those of you who don't know, the UK actually has legislation, the Climate Change Act, which was brought in 2008, and that mandates carbon reduction in the public, in the public sector at least. Um, and that target is an 80% reduction on carbon, 80% reduction in carbon emissions on 1990 levels. So that's the start of the graph by 2050. So you can see that the final um, triangle on the orange line for 2050, that, that's the ultimate target. And then the interim targets are those other points on the orange line. So what does this graph tell you? Um, I guess the first observation is that since around 2008, when the SCU was set up, they've actually made some progress. Um, that um, emissions are trending downwards, but that's the light blue line, but that we're not on completely on track to meet those targets. That's the red line. We, we're at the light blue line, we really need to get the red line. Um, and I guess the most interesting thing for me from that graph is if you look at this graph and what is actually required, this sort of target isn't going to be achieved, this end target isn't going to be achieved by changing through light bulbs and staff cycling to work. This sort of requirement is actually going to re require complete transformation of the healthcare system. Um, so, that leads um, quite nicely into sort of what I'm doing in my PhD. Um, so as I mentioned, I'm one year into a, into a three-year a three PhD. My main interest and the two main research questions are, firstly, what does a sustainable health and social care system look like? What would it look like uh, in the future? And then the second question, which I'm coming to realise is sort of equally as important. Um, the second question is, uh, and how can we most effectively transition or transform towards that, that system. Okay, just before I move on, Nina, no questions so far? No, no, you're good to go. Okay, good. Um, okay, so I, as I said at the start, I've selected two aspects of my research um, to discuss. Uh, the first one uh, is pockets of the future in the present. So this was the first paper that I wrote. Um, it was actually called Future Healthcare? Question um, mark. And that, for those who are interested, it's about to be published in the AHR. So um, look out for that in the coming uh, weeks, I think. And I guess this was this emerged as part of my literature review. So the, obviously, the first thing you do when you're undertaking this sort of research is do a literature review and find out what the current state of play is, so that you're up to speed and that you don't um, end up with trying to reinvent the wheel. Um, and so this paper has evolved from that part of my literature review and uh, essentially it's about you know, uh, what are the, the pockets of innovation that are going on in the current healthcare system that may become mainstream practice in the future or you know, in simple terms what are the, the key emerging trends in healthcare. And actually, I was thinking that for those of you, those of you at, at, um, in your different workplaces might actually like to just jot down yourself now um, what you think those trends, what you think those trends might be. So we can sort of compare, um, see, see how many we agree on um, as I'm talking about this. Um, I came up with, with six trends and I'd just like to describe um, those briefly. So the first one that I had um, I call 
uh, the subheading was first do no harm. And this, uh, I guess the premise of this is that um, there are significant harms, risks and costs of um, overdiagnosis and overtreatment um, and that in future there will be much, there is likely to be much less medicine. And the discussion then is, um, sorry, is also about um, patients becoming more involved in their care and having more autonomy and uh, being involved as decision makers in their own care. So that's the first one. Second one uh, was ICT, uh, Information Communication Technology. And that's um, sort of depicted by the, the picture in the top, top left hand corner. Um, and the, prediction, the predictions for ICT are that, uh, firstly, uh, in the future, there are, it, it is likely that most countries will have, uh, in many cases, uh, quite sophisticated um, electronic health record systems, um, tracking and monitoring and, and providing data. And that once um, all that data is um, recorded and, uh, and standardised and aggregated, then a huge amount um, of a vast of data resource uh, will be provided, and that's so-called big data. And there'll be you know, tremendous implications of that from anything from, from research right through to running hospitals. Um, hospitals themselves would be dig they call digit digitally enabled, um, and so be able to be much more efficiently run, and many um, processes which are currently undertaken by staff could be automated. So there would be implications for hospitals, for research, for many other areas. Um, the other big area, I guess, in ICT is um, telehealth and telemedicine. So those sorts of things really uh, change the, the, the main setting of healthcare. So the second one, the third one uh, was patient empowerment and, that, and, the, and to some extent the quantified self-movement. And the quantified self-movement is depicted there in the in the picture of the Fitbits in the top right hand corner. Um, so essentially the premise here is that patients will be much more uh, involved in their own care with um, self-management, expert patient programs, shared decision making, decision making tools, different initiatives. Um, and interestingly in terms of um, electronic health records, um, the prediction is that patients will have actually much more will have uh, a degree of co-ownership or, or interactivity with their electronic health records. Um, that is not just access, but actually be able to interact with them. Um, also, um, online health communities, which are becoming uh, increasingly sort of commonplace, I guess, in the US. Um, then the quantified self movement, um, as many of you would be aware, sort of the Fitbits, the sort of the, the um, early harbingers of, of this movement. Um, the prediction is that in future there'll be many more, more sophisticated and more varied um, self-monitoring devices. And of course, it's difficult to say whether that will be a sort of net positive or net, net negative sort of effect, depending on how they're used, what effects they have on people's behaviour, uh, and so on. So that was. Uh, the third theme, the fourth theme, social capital and resilience. Um, and I started this section of my paper by talking about the Rosetto example. So Rosetto, uh, to tell the story, Rosetto is a small Italian-American town in Pennsylvania in the US. And in the 1950s, um, researchers and health workers were amazed at the extraordinarily low rates of heart attacks uh, in Rosetto compared to neighbouring towns. And this effect remained even after controlling for the known cardiovascular risk factors, but even after controlling for weight and physical activity and smoking status and, and a bunch of other things, that, that effect remained. And what they found, um, what was well, the theory and at that time and what is actually now very well documented and increasingly well understood is that social capital and resilience can actually be, are actually independent, um, uh, independent uh, factors uh, improving health outcomes. 
So people with really uh, with more and varied social relationships and networks um, actually have better health outcomes across a range of indicators. In Rosetto, they were very tightly knit, it's a very tightly knit um, Italian community. They all come from the same a similar region in Italy. Very strong social networks, people looking after each other, um, lots of social cohesion and support. Um, so that was the sort of first known example of that. Um, and now the, the examples that I provide in my paper of, of that, um, of what is being done in that space now um, are, are about micro providers and the move towards asset based approaches and so on, in the, uh, particularly in the UK. The fifth uh, theme um, was ageing and integration. Um, and the premise for this is that keeping older people healthy and socially active delays the need for them uh, for formal care and reduces the health and social care costs. Uh, and the examples provided there were the UK's neighbourhood networks um, and Germany's multi-generational houses. I don't know if you've heard of the uh, multi-generational houses. These are um, essentially uh, community centres that have been set up, a number of them across Germany. Um, they're community centres in which many different age groups um, are essentially, uh, there are services for many different age groups under the one roof. So in one centre there might be, for example, a kindergarten, um, a drop-in centre for, uh, for new parents, um, after school care, things for school aged children, as well as um, social care and social services for um, elderly people to come and play cards or interact and talk and, and do activities. And they've actually been found to be tremendously successful um, with uh, programs emerging from them such as um, teenagers providing help for older people in terms of learning about email and technology. Um, retirees providing childcare and babysitting help for young families. Um, and so the idea is that what I found is that sort of to some extent replicates the um, intergenerational um, uh, integration that used to happen you know, within families and communities that, that, that is very much more scarce now. So those have been um, really important in the health space as well. And then the final theme was a good death. So many people in our current healthcare system um, at the end of their lives receive care that is inappropriate and or futile. Uh, so the discussion uh, in this section was about um, focusing on what they call compression of morbidity. So that is, um, the aim is to live a long and healthy life, then you have a, a very short period of morbidity uh, and then a good death. Uh, and obviously, there's a, uh, the other important things are you know, advanced care planning, advanced care directives, really important, uh, excellent communication between families and um, patients themselves and healthcare providers and so on. But that, that was the final thing. So those were the six um, themes that um, I came up with. And the conclusion in my paper was that um, current trends indicate that in the future uh, healthcare is likely to be an interesting mix of both technological innovation but at the same time a return to sort of old, more old fashioned community social, social integration type values. Okay, so that was my first paper. Um, in my second paper I looked at uh, examples of uh, transformational change uh, in healthcare. And the best example by far that I have come across uh, is that of a place called South Central Foundation in Alaska, of all places in the UK. And this is a, a healthcare system, it's not the only one in Alaska, it's one of about half a dozen, I think, healthcare um, systems. Alaska. And uh, I want to just tell the story, I guess, of, um, of SDF because I think it, um, there are a number of, sort of key learning points from, from that story. 
So, SEA. Um, in the 1980s, the story starts, I guess, in the 1980s, when uh, Alaskan healthcare was really, was really very poor. It was inefficient, there were long waiting times, um, emergency activity was escalating, and they were, they described, atrocious health outcomes um, with low life expectancies and endemic uh, chronic illness. As I was reading about it, it sort of reminds of Indigenous healthcare in this country, you know, 10 or 20 years ago, and it was extremely poor. I mean, it's not very good now, but extremely poor uh, in the past. So that was the situation in the 80s. In the late 1990s, um, as a result of several different factors of coming together, and those factors were you know, long term, this is a combination of long period of um, indigenous advocacy for self-determination, as well as some um, US legislative changes, um, as well as obviously demonstrable value of the current system. But those factors and a number of others got to the point, um, uh, it got to the point at which um, the uh, local community, the indigenous community and sort of healthcare um, leaders were given the opportunity to radically redesign um, their healthcare system. The story goes that the federal government said to them, essentially said to them, you can't have any more money, we're not increasing the funding at all, but you can run it yourselves. And so they, they took this opportunity and they really started from scratch. They redesigned uh, their healthcare system. And after 10 years, they ha had achieved quite extraordinary results. Um, their emergency department visits were down by 42%, hospital days down by 36%, specialty care reduced by 58%. Anyone with any sort of familiarity with healthcare outcomes will understand these are really extraordinary figures. Um, and at the same time, dramatic improvements in strokes, in suicides, heart disease, infant mortality, childhood asthma, and a whole range of um, health outcomes. And these were health outcomes had previously been down the bottom of many of these, of the ladder, uh, in terms of US, where the states and different health systems are ranked, and they were heading right up towards the top. So quite, you know, quite an extraordinary turnaround. So of course the question is, well, how, how did they do it? And this is what I was um, really interested in in, in, writing my, in writing this paper. So they essentially rethought and redesigned every single aspect of um, care from recruitment, training, deployment, um, models of care, uh, informa information performance management systems, um, how they built facilities, all those things. Um, and there, I guess there are a number of features uh, to this transformation that I'd just like to discuss. Firstly, The first one is that they just, at the start, they just listened. For about, they said, the first 12 months, they did nothing else but listen. Um, so really sort of extensive consultation. And community members could provide feedback in about, there are about a dozen different ways in which they could provide feedback. They did sort of community forums, sort of family events, uh, interviews, focus groups, to provide feedback by mail, social media, internet, phone, a bunch of different ways. And just for 12 months, they just listened to feedback, basically to was comments about the existing system and about really about what they wanted, what the healthcare system they wanted for their community. So they just listened. After about 12 months, they, the, health, the leadership team sat down and developed um, a clear vision and a mission statement um, and key performance indicators and so on, a number of objectives under that vision and mission. And they describe their vision as of a healthcare system that valued the patient maybe more than they valued the doctor. And and then they and then they delivered it. So the, the key features um, the, the key thing that came across to me in reading about SDF and speaking to people about it was that it's essentially 
exceptionally strong primary care. So they've remodeled the system so that um, every there, there's a series of primary care teams. Each primary care team is led by is headed up by a, a doctor, so a GP or an internal physician, general physician. So a doctor heads up and, there's, and they work with a, a quite a close knit team of allied health staff. So a couple of RNs, physiotherapy, behavioural health consultant, have several of those that health psychologists, um, and then obviously sort of people, you know, diabetes educator, antenatal care, and so on. So everybody they work as a team. Doctor heads up with the allied health staff. There is a, um, a, a system of empanelment. So each of those the primary care team looks after. Um, I don't know, a couple of thousand patients, but sort of a, a capitation type system in a way, and they're responsible for looking after those patients and for their health outcome. Um, from the patient's point of view, and by the way, patients are not called patients, are called customer owners, but you can ask me about that. The customer owners um, are allocated to a team that they can change teams if they like, so they're, you know, they, can, they can choose. And the idea is that the, the primary care team develops a very strong relationship with their customer owners. Um, there's a really strong focus on prevention and health and wellness. Um, and then those and then there's t the teams are um, work to some extent in competition with each other but not very much. That the, the the staff are paid a salary, are all salaried with a small amount, I think it's up to like ten percent or something of their salary based on incentives. So there's a sort of a small incentive system but it's uh, largely salaried. The teams, it's very, very egalitarian within the teams. The team all works, to, all sits together. It's sort of an open plan situation. Doctors don't have a separate office or a better seat or desk or anything like that. So they all work together and they communicate obviously very well. Patients who call up can be seen. They, they guarantee that patients, if they want to, customer owners, sorry, will be can be seen on that that day um, if they want to. Um, and as people are coming in for their appointments, then they make sure that. Anything else that needs to be done that day, anything else that needs to be done for that patient can also be done at that day. So if they're due for a diabetes check, or if they're due to have their feet checked or something else, then that all happens in the one at the one on the one day, to, which makes a much more efficient um, service. But a lot of a lot and increasingly amount um, of consulting are done over the phone um, or by other ICT methods rather than um, exclusively face to face. They have really great facilities. They have meeting rooms and talking rooms in which they talk to patients. They have great rooms set up specifically for family meetings in which they involve you know, everybody involved in, in the care of a particular customer owner. Um, a lot of other features of their, their primary care system, a lot of culturally appropriate art and a really nice, you know, a really nice space to be in, very social space. Um, so that's essentially their, their primary care, very strong on prevention, very strong on relationships. Um, and they also, I guess the other key features are that they have very sophisticated data and performance management systems. They have something called Datamol, which apparently is like a thousand times better than electronic health records. Um, basically very sophisticated IT provides real-time um, monitoring and performance um, statistics on every, on every team. So you can see in real-time how each team is performing. Um, and then teams who are performing well are encouraged to share their ideas and their, you know, uh, their tips with other teams. And so, on. so there's some some competition, but um, a lot of um, collaboration as well. Um, and then I guess the final aspect of of their um, system of their structure <coughs> is that they aim for continual improvement. They have their feed, the consultation they did initially has. Continue not to the same extent, but has continued in, in, in a very good form to this day. So they're constantly responding to feedback and trying to improve and adapt their system um, based on the feedback they receive from their customer owners. Um, and they invest a lot of time in uh, training their staff um, and in, sort of in performance management and ongoing sort of continual, continual professional development. Their, the current chief executive started out. 20, 30 years ago as a receptionist um, in their organisation and a lot of their doctors were originally nurses and nurses were originally um, health educators or whatever. So they, they really 
spend a lot of time in training and upskilling um, all of their staff. And one of the ideas is that everybody really works at the top of their game, um, the doc at the top of their skill level. Doctors, uh, when a patient comes in, they're essentially triaged by a, an RN level person who does the basic medical staff or will um, direct that customer owner to see you know, the diabetes educator or the physiotherapist or whoever. Um, and the sort of tricky diagnostic and, and, and medical uh, complex medical matters are, are what the, the doctor deals with. So everybody works really at the top of their skill set. Um, so they you know, try and get the, the best of everyone, the most efficient um, use of resources. So that's um, SCF. Um, you can see the quote there on the slide. Don Berwick was a, um, an advisor to the a health advisor to the Obama administration, <clears throat> and now I think has quite a senior role in NHS. And he, in his view, SCF is the, the best example of healthcare redesign that he's seen. Um, and SCF has conferences every year and has a growing number of international um, observers um, coming to those conferences and trying to set up um, a similar sort of model in their own um, systems, both in the US and overseas, and particularly in Scotland as well. So that's SCF, a um, great example of redesign and also you know, what a future system might look like. The interesting thing for me, I guess, is to, to, to think that as far as I know, they haven't done this, you know, the carbon footprinting or the sustainability evaluation of SCS, but judging from their efficiency and, and their results and um, the, the incredible health outcomes that they're achieving, it's likely that they will be you know, one of the most sustainable, environmentally sustainable systems around as well. Um, so that's, I guess, the, sort of the next step uh, for me in my doctoral research. So that's SCF. Um, and I'd be very happy now, as I mentioned at the start, to take any questions. Anyone um, has, any, has any questions? Thank you. I'll open the, um, the microphone so that everyone can speak. I believe there's people that are only connected in but don't have a camera or a microphone, so that's a possibility. In that instance, please use the group chat on the side. Nina, what's your advice to me? Should I now go to the... Um, stop sharing or and then so I can see people asking questions or aren't if you're done um, with your presentation yep yep um, hi Kate Genevieve can you hear me hi, Genevieve. yeah <laughs> now, I was just wondering how the um, how they did time management in the SDF project um, it sounds wonderful, the um, patients, customer owners, whatever, um, mm -hmm. being able to get all that they um, need attending to or want attending to done on the same day. Yeah. Um, so they I have, can, really, they have, I guess, that as people are coming in on their way in, the administrative staff, as I understand, the administrative staff check up, because they have such good IT, they can just call up a patient and see what they're due for when. So if they're due for a diabetes check in two weeks' time, then they'll do that then. Um, they just clump things together because there's often quite significant distances and things involved. For those who don't live in Anchorage, they're at a distance, so it's much more efficient to get everything done at once. But I think it, you know, this, this data model that they call it sounds extraordinary because they just have data at their fingertips. It means the whole thing just runs Apparently, like, I mean, I've, I've had spoken to people who've been there, so it just runs like absolute clockwork. You know? And the administrative staff, for example, um, have got undergo two weeks of training before they even start. So they're trained in, you know, the, the philosophy and the values of service, of, you know, providing really good service to customer owners, how to um, speak to people, how to relate to them, how to, you know, how to... Um, Organise, you know, all these sort of things. How to manage, obviously, the, the data model and so on. So, they, they, the, the training is quite extraordinary. That's you know, that's the administrative staff. They do two weeks of training or something. It's quite amazing. I'm just trying to imagine how you know you're going to end up with a little queue of people that need to see particular professionals. Yeah. Um, you know, if they're if the Patients are all happy to do that because they've come a long distance or whatever. 
Uh, I just can't quite see how it would work other than the fact that they're all going to have to wait a little while um, to see all the different people that they need to see. You know, there'll be a queue for the doctor at some point. And, yeah, uh, there may well be. I guess the interest, I guess the thing, they said when they, the first few years it was really tough, I think, because mm. they were implementing a whole new model and it was tough on the staff because doctors, they gave a guarantee to patients that you would be seen that day if you wanted to. And so doctors who weren't, they said doctors who weren't managing their team, utilising their team appropriately, who were doing too much themselves, were the ones staying there till 10 o'clock at night. And in the first few years, apparently, a lot of, a lot of doctors quit um, because they didn't adapt very well to the new model. It's interesting, they said the, the doctors who have stayed and who love it, there's two groups of doctors. Firstly, the ones who are pretty junior, pretty freshly out of medical school, and for whom the philosophies and values of SCF really fit with, you know, the reason they, they why they got into medicine in the first place. So those doctors are really keen. And the other group is the sort of the very experienced old school GPs who have, for them, this, this model is a dream. You know, this is really good continuity of care, really, you know, family medicine at its best. You know, this, this sort of care that they're providing. So those two groups are the main sort of doctors, SDF doctors that they've got and they've retained and trained up and, and people who've come also from elsewhere to work at SDF. Um, so they said the first few years are really tough adapting to this system and it takes a while for um, to train up RNs for instance at the, at the first port of call. So all calls and all medical calls go through to the RN which they've sort of trained up these very experienced RNs, um, trained up in sort of triage so they, only the tricky stuff goes to the doctors and then everything else is distributed. Because most, most times people actually don't need to see a doctor. Most of it, you know, chronic disease management, diabetes educated, podiatrist, optometrist, those, those sort of things. So a lot of, once, it's, once you've sorted out, you've got the right numbers of staff, they had a lot of extra, they had to pay for, have a lot of extra staff at the start really to get through those few years. But once, now that it's sort of evened out, they have really good data and they know exactly you know, how many people are, are, are go, are, it's likely how many people are going to want to see a diabetes educator today, then they can, they can plan much better. So that, I think that, you know, after, after a few years, once you've got it sorted out, once you know every day what you're going to be expecting, then it, then it you know, you can, you can work something very efficiently. Mm. Yeah, I think it was a tough year to start. Yeah, and I still think I can the, still see the patient stay, spending quite a, you know, spending at least a couple of hours, if they've got various different things that require different health professionals, yep. um, I could see them spending a bit of time, you know, waiting around in between each one. Yep. Each one yeah, I'm, and, I'm sure they do, but, mm. but that's better for, for patients. I think they prefer that, one of the feedback they got was patients prefer that rather than making four different trips over a few months. And the other thing is they've got, as I said at the start, they've redesigned, they needed a new primary care centre, so they've rebuilt this primary care centre. And apparently it's amazing, it's got a big, Sort of lobby um, foyer space at, at, at you know where you first walk in with sort of indigenous art and you know really nice space, really light and airy and, and so on. And that's really like a social meeting place, like a community centre now. Because people just come there and even if they don't have an appointment, they come there and chat and see their relatives and friends and, and so on. So it's quite a social space. And then so people don't mind, I think, spending half a day there if they get all their medical appointments done and then see their friends. It's, it's this idea. As I was, you know, in talking about six emerging trends, this social capital, this social resilience, integration, value of community, those sort of things are taken very seriously, and I think they're sort of reaping the benefits of that. Presumably, there's a sense of community ownership too with it. Yeah. So I didn't go in. So that's the customer owner thing. So this is the the, the history and the politics is quite, I think, quite complex and had been going for a long time. But essentially, there's they were advocating for a long time for self-determination. So the indigenous community actually has a degree of their customers, but they're also owners, part owners in this system. So they have, you know, very strong involvement in it, as well as being customers. And customers, they use that word rather than patients because you get better service if you're, if you're a customer as opposed to a patient. So, yeah, they're, they're customer owners. They have, you know, a, a degree of ownership and interactivity with the system. This is their, you know, this is their system. What do you want? We're here to serve you. But it's, it's not lip service as you get in many systems. It's actually, you know, very genuine from what I understand. Thank you.
no more questions from the group chat either. Okay, great. Thanks very much, everyone. Um, Nina mentioned I should just, um, if you have any questions, I'm very happy to answer them. Um, my email address is Kate, all lowercase, kate.charlesworth uh, at gmail.com. That's the best one. My university one's a bit tricky. So kate.charlesworth at gmail.com. Very happy to answer questions at any time. Thanks very much. Thanks, Nina, also for your assistance. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very Thanks, much. Kate. Bye.